Hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's good to be with you on this Thursday, May 26th. And tonight, we're talking through our confusion over Tuesday's mass shooting in Texas. A news conference this afternoon may have raised more questions than it answered. There's a 12 minute gap from when he, brought, he crashes his truck to when he enters the school. 12 minutes. What happened in that 12 minutes? You can hear the confusion from Tom Yamas, but we'll break down what we know and what we don't know. Also, when a gunman attacks, what are police trained to do? And did they do it in Uvalde? Tomorrow, the NRA starts its annual convention in Texas. We'll consider what gun safety measures might survive its influence. Then, another big legal debate in America, Roe v. Wade. You've told us how religion has shaped your views on abortion rights. A panel of faith leaders joins us ahead. And former President Trump is under court orders to testify about his business practices. What might that mean for his company and his family? You know, today was supposed to be the last day of the school year in Uvalde, Texas. The shooting at Robb Elementary School happened just after a year-end honor roll ceremony. And now that city is planning to lay victims of the attack to rest. President Biden and First Lady Dr. Jill Biden plan to visit this Sunday. People have been coming to the center of town, paying their respects at crosses, representing each victim. Many said prayers and wrote messages for the families of the 19 students and two teachers who were killed. We're learning more details about how the shooting happened, awful as they are. Tonight, investigators say the victims were found in four different classrooms. And this afternoon, the Texas Department of Public Safety updated the timeline of the shooting. That filled in some gaps and revealed others. Officials say the shooter crashed his car near the school at 11.28 a.m. Two minutes later, the first 911 call came in about a man with a gun. Ten minutes after that, he entered the school, 1140. Four minutes later, Uvalde police arrived but did not engage him. Officials say it took about an hour after the shooter entered the school before a Border Patrol tactical team went in and killed him. So there are two gaps in what we know about the police response. A 14-minute gap after that 911 call, and a one-hour gap at the school. A DPS regional director took questions on that today. The initial officers, they receive gunfire. They don't make entry initially because of the gunfire they're receiving. But we have officers calling for additional resources. Everybody that's in the area, tactical teams. We need equipment. We need specialty equipment. We need body armor, we need precision riflemen, negotiators. So during that time that they're making those calls to bring in help to solve this problem and stop it immediately, they're also evacuating personnel, let's say personnel, students, teachers. There's a lot going on. Let's begin in Uvalde with NBC senior national correspondent Carrie Sanders. And Carrie, I wonder what your takeaways were from the news conference. I think immediately after, several of us were kind of shaking our heads at how some things got clearer and some things got a little more opaque. They left a lot of unanswered questions. You know, the unanswered questions, Joshua, really kind of goes with the credibility here of the Texas DPS because they had said one thing, for instance, telling everybody initially, not us saying it, but them saying it on camera, that there had been a school resource officer that confronted the gunman. Now they're saying there was no school resource officer and confronting many people wondered, does that mean that the officer had a gun and didn't use it? And now we know there was no school resource officer but most importantly holding this news conference to even give preliminary information about a timeline has only raised so many questions and you know you might think okay these are reporters questions no these are the questions that the victims families are asking these are the questions that those who live in this community are asking and maybe these are even the questions that all of those in our country are asking. Because first of all, you have that window where 
uh, the gunman takes his stolen pickup truck, crashes it into the ditch, gets out at uh, 1128. When he's getting out, as you so appropriately said, we're looking at this timeline, the first thing people in the neighborhood think is, somebody's had a car accident, let's go help. He exits out of the passenger side, and then he has a gun in his hand and he has a bag, which we later found out had uh, ammunition, and he begins shooting. And so those people who are rushing then retreat. Within two minutes, as you noted, there's a 911 call. The suspect, or the gunman now, goes over the fence and for 10 minutes is trying to get into the school. Now, we don't have the specifics of that 10 minutes. It's a long time. So looking for a door, looking for an entryway, finds an open door and goes in. So the police department is 1.2 miles away. If you were following the laws of the road and stopping at every stop sign, it would take you five minutes to get here. And of course, with sirens blaring and lights going, officers could be here within moments. But in that window now, that 10 to 12 minute window before the gunman gets into the school, there are so many questions about where is the response? Where are the people who should be protecting and responding? There's a 911 call. We expect a quick response when 911, especially in a small town like this, it's not right. that far from the police department as I noted to here. So, the gunman gets in and he's apparently going to walk down 20 steps one way, another 20 steps another way, and he gets inside a classroom. As Jonathan Deans and Pete Williams have now reported with their contacts within Texas DPS and elsewhere, uh, the gunman apparently went into more than just the one classroom. And I refer to it as one classroom because it sounds like it was sort of a shared classroom. Two teachers, two groups of students with sort of a divider, I think, and it was open. And so that's the one classroom or the two classrooms that we were aware of. Now we're finding out there were two more classrooms that the gunman went into. But most importantly, and this is really the question that so many people are asking here, is the gunman is inside. They use the word barricaded. It sounds like the door is locked. And the officers are outside. And that's where this back and forth of waiting stakes takes place. And the DPS here said that, well, they were in the process of negotiating. So my first question was when you say negotiating, was the gunman responding? And they said no. So I'm not sure negotiating is the right word, but we have this period of time where family members, especially those who had children who died, are now asking, wait a second, in that hour, could my child have still been alive? Could officers have gotten in some way? We know eventually when the Border Patrol team arrived about an hour later with all of their tactical gear, that they still got the key from the school principal to unlock the door, which raises the question, why didn't the other officers try to get a key and do this? And then the other question, which I think is a relatively fair question, in the crisis of the moment, unable to get in the door, why didn't they pick up the phone and call in the fire department and get some of their gear? That's what yeah. fire departments do. They breach on, a, on every emergency. You're stuck in a car, the jaws of life, the, the you need to get into a burning building, a battering ram. They have so much of this gear and that was not at play here. So at the end of the day, Joshua, you have family members here who are not only heartbroken, not only anguished, but they're angry. And when they hear from the DPS that there was this hour gap, and then the reporters repeatedly asked, wait a second, what about this hour? And the DPS said, no more questions. You know, uh, uh, the, 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 the spokesman was sort of like, we're gonna deal with this later. It just opened right. up so much more for people who are angry. And Joshua, at the end of the day, you know, the DPS, I think, lost a lot of their credibility here because, you know, people are looking for answers and now they're not sure whether they can believe much of what they're hearing from those wearing uniforms. Well, hopefully those answers will be quick in coming, but you raised a lot of good questions we're going to get into with our next guest. Thank you, Carrie. That's NBC senior national correspondent Carrie Sanders starting us off tonight from Uvalde, Texas. Let's get more into the police response and some of those questions that Carrie just raised. Some parents at Robb Elementary say they urged officers outside to charge into the school. Javier Caceres lost his daughter, a fourth grader, in the attack. At one point, he said, quote, let's just rush in because the cops aren't doing anything like they are supposed to do, unquote. But are they supposed to do that? What are law enforcement officers trained to do when confronting an active shooter? 
A video uploaded to Facebook shows parents and onlookers demanding more action. To be clear, it's unclear when the video was taken or whether officers were inside the school at the time. Man, y'all can't be like that, man. Y'all can't be like that when there's people. Yes, I do. Get across the street. Because I'm having to deal with you. Get across the street. Get across the street. Okay, we're going to back up. Are you going to walk into that gate and get him? You got to get fighting with us. Go get fighting with them. I'm going to have the rifles here. You know that there are kids, right? They're little kids. They don't know how to defend themselves. A statement from Uvalde police reads in part, quote, it is important for our community to know that our officers responded within minutes alongside Uvalde ISD officers. That's the independent school district. Responding UPD officers sustained gunshot wounds from the subject, unquote. Let's continue now with Kenneth Gray. He is a retired FBI special agent and a senior lecturer at the University of New Haven's Department of Criminal Justice. Mr. Gray, good evening. Thank you for making time for us. Hi, Joshua. Can you just walk us through your thoughts on the way this went down, starting with the timeline as we know it so far? We're more than 48 hours out from the shooting. What do you make of the info we have so far compared to what one might expect law enforcement to know at this point in the investigation? So I am not surprised that uh, we are getting conflicting stories at this point because there are a lot of moving parts here uh, and it takes time to do an investigation to find out exactly what happened. I understand that there was over 100 officers total that are, were here on the scene. It takes time to interview each and every one of those officers to gather things like video and to put together that with the uh, radio traffic to try to put together an accurate timeline. So the fact that the governor had his press conference uh, and put out one story, and now the story is changing as we get more information, that really is not that surprising. It does take time to get the correct details. Well, how is it that the, the public is getting one picture through reporters that is raising questions about what we're getting from law enforcement? I know investigations take time and the legal you know, bar for them is obviously higher, but I'm not sure I understand why there's not someone we could go to who would have a clear view of what happened sooner. Well, I think the problem is, is that they are still trying to determine what happened. That is, it takes time to put together the real picture here of exactly what happened. And so the earlier press conference that was held by Governor Abbott uh, had incomplete information. And that incomplete information compared to what we now know today makes it look like the story changed. But it's the fact that the earlier story was based upon what people thought happened as opposed to what they are now learning happened based upon putting together the, the full picture. With regard to the parents who were demanding more action, that the officers would rush into the school, what are officers, generally speaking, every law enforcement agency is a little different, Texas might be different than Connecticut, than New York, than elsewhere, but generally speaking, if I'm a police officer and I show up at the scene of an active shooter situation, what am I trained to do and what am I trained not to do? So in 1999, at the Columbine shooting, at that point, the response plan was you put up a perimeter, you uh, start negotiation, and you try to talk the person out. Columbine proved that that does not work with an active shooter situation. So as a result of the Columbine shooting, a new plan was put together for active shooters. And that is you wait until you get a minimum number of officers present that can form an active shooter team, and then they move towards the sound of gunfire to go and address the threat. They don't stop to rescue people. They don't stop to, uh, to interview people. They move towards whatever the threat is and address the threat. Four to five officers might not take a while to get that many people to arrive on the scene before you go in. And so it is now the uh, protocol to go in with less than four, two to three officers. But the 
standing protocol is, is that once you get that number of officers, they are supposed to go towards the active shooter to address that threat. Two officers apparently went into the school, went towards the gunfire, and were met with rounds from uh, the shooter. So they stopped at that point. Uh, they may have had handguns versus a long gun. Uh, that would make it very hard to be able to successfully handle that threat. But nonetheless, they started to go in, took fire, and backed off. That's uh, what the difference is between active shooter protocol and the old type of pro protocol, is that the backing off should not have happened with an active shooter under the, the standard policy. With regard to what happens now, we got a lot of comments from viewers just asking about ways to secure schools. We got a very brief voicemail from Evelyn in California. Here's what she left in our inbox. I just want to say I think schools should have security guards. It's not a bad idea. Evelyn, thank you for sharing that. And quite a few schools not only have security guards, they have armed police officers. But as we've learned from previous incidents, having a police officer on campus, one, does not guarantee they'll respond. That's what happened at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. And two, doesn't guarantee that they're going to be able to meet the threat. I mean, if you are looking for someone rushing the campus and someone hits you with a long gun from a distance you can't see, there's always a way to overpower or outgun or outthink an officer on post. But that's my perception. Before I have to let you go, how do you see Evelyn's comment? So I, I agree, and most uh, states do have resource officers, and at, uh, some even have armed police officers at schools. Uh, I think that there might be some lessons learned from the airline industry after 9-11, and that is, is that they started a flight officer, uh, flight officer armed flight officer program where uh, flight deck officers can receive uh, firearms training, certification, and continued uh, ongoing certification process. And when they are on board flights that they are part of the crew, they can carry a firearm in a lockbox into that aircraft, put it on once they are on the aircraft, and then they are armed for the period of the flight, at which time they have to take that gun off, put it back in the lockbox, and take it off the aircraft. So perhaps an armed teacher program where not every teacher is armed, but instead those who wish to volunteer to go through training and become armed, that would help augment any type of security force at a school. And there are some school districts and states that have allowed teachers to voluntarily go through that kind of training if they so desire. Highly controversial, but there is a growing number of districts that are allowing for that as well. Retired FBI Special Agent Kenneth Gray, appreciate you making time, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Still to come, the NRA. Its annual convention is tomorrow in Houston. We'll consider how its political power might shape gun safety measures this time around. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. The NRA. After the shooting in Texas, a lot of you turned your anger toward this powerful group. It has had little to say this week, but tomorrow its annual meeting begins in Houston. Speakers include former President Donald Trump and South Dakota's governor, Kristi Noem. Two Republican lawmakers from Texas have canceled their speeches. Congressman Dan Crenshaw of Houston and Senator John Cornyn. Spokespeople say the shooting is not why they will miss the convention. Senator Cornyn reportedly pulled out for personal reasons. The remaining speakers and the NRA can expect some furious protests outside the convention center. And we just got a statement that says Congressman Beto O'Rourke will be among the protesters. We did reach out to the NRA to take part in tonight's discussion. We did not hear back, but the invitation stands. Senator Ted Cruz is on the speaker's list. Here's part of what he told a correspondent from our partners at Sky News. Why is this American exceptionalism so awful? 
you know, I'm sorry you think American exceptionalism is awful. I think I, this I, aspect, I think, I think this I, aspect you know of it. You get your political agenda. No, it's God, honestly, God love you. But you can't answer that. Can, you can't answer that, can you say? You can't answer that. Why you know, is this country? Why is it that people come from all over the world to America? Because it's the freest, most prosperous, safest so country on Earth. Maybe the, the, and it may be the freest, maybe the most popular. Why are our kids dying in Joining us now is Eric Rubin. He teaches on the Second Amendment at Southern Methodist University's Dedman School of Law. He is also a fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice. Professor Rubin, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on. I feel like that exchange between Senator Cruz and our correspondent from Sky sums up a lot of the power of the NRA in a nutshell. That for people who support the NRA, it's not about guns. It's about freedom. It's about American identity. It's about not being told what to do or how to live. And frankly, it's about having a cudgel big enough to hit someone else who disagrees over the head. Is there something I'm missing? No, I think that's true. I think that one of the things that we're seeing right now and the quick reaction, especially on the right, on the political right, to the shooting this week, is that uh, a knee-jerk reaction to any sort of restrictions on firearms has become deeply entrenched in the Republican Party and in the conservative movement, it's become almost an identity. And a lot of that could be attributed to the efforts over the decades by the NRA to instill this ethos in, uh, in, in the American public and in politicians. We've heard a lot over the last few days about the power of the NRA. We had a very good conversation Tuesday night when we were expecting to do election night coverage about how the NRA kind of evolved into the organization that it is from being very much about just like gun safety and Boy Scouts would go get merit badges from the NRA for learning how to shoot a hunting rifle to being what it is today. It's also gone through a number of leadership challenges lately, a bankruptcy filing. What is the strength of the NRA right now? I'm wondering whether we're fighting, whether we're dealing with a tiger or a paper tiger in the NRA. And that's a really good question. I think it's hard to say right now. If you look back to the post Sandy Hook week, most conservative lawmakers waited for the National Rifle Association to um, say what its position was going to be before they came out with the position themselves. They didn't wait this week. In fact, they came out quickly in opposition to almost any gun regulation. And again, I think that that's a, an indication that even while the NRA is going through these difficulties and is in turmoil, the, um, the, the norm of just opposing any restrictions on firearms is, is deeply instilled in the conservative legal movement right now. And there are other organizations that are cropping up. Um, but ultimately, a lot of the power comes from a highly mobilized group of NRA members and gun owners who are single issue voters and who go out and vote in primaries. And a lot of politicians are afraid that if they get raided badly by the NRA, then that will imperil their ability to stay in power. Imperil their ability to stay in power and their ability to raise enough money for their campaigns, perhaps? Yeah, there's certainly a lot of money has been thrown by the gun rights movement and by the National Rifle Association to these politicians who are coming out very um, robustly against uh, firearm re uh, regulation these days. You see on the right of your screen the grand totals of some of the money that the NRA has spent with politicians. And that gets to one viewer comment that an anonymous viewer sent us about the politics of all of this. Here's what they left in our inbox. People ought not vote for anybody that can't stand up for children, can't stand up for innocent people that are trying to just go shopping, go to church, go to school, do the right thing, live a life, because the Republicans will not have a spine and a backbone to do something for this country. Thank you for sending your thoughts to us, whoever you are. Professor Rubin, how do you see that in terms of this being very squarely a Republican Party problem rather than a power of the NRA problem. There, I mean, it's hard to point to a whole lot of Democrats who have strong ratings from the NRA or who are as much in the group's thrall as Republicans are. So when we're talking about the power of the NRA, are we really talking about just Republicans or is there more to it than that? Yeah, well, I think that one of the things that the, um, the, the, the quote that you just played reflects is that in the years after Sandy Hook, there has become an, there, there has happened um, an emboldened movement on the other side for gun violence prevention and gun safety. And 
that movement has gained steam with groups like Every Town for Gun Safety and the Gifford Center, and after the Parkland shooting, an increased student movement for gun safety regulation. So one thing that's very different now than in the past is in past decades, perhaps there wasn't a strong counterpunch against the National Rifle Association and its power, but now there is increasingly such a counterpunch. And in fact, a lot of Democratic politicians are running on gun safety issues in ways that they haven't in the past, and they're winning. And there you see Democratic Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy, who was very upset about what happened on Tuesday and asked his fellow senators, what are we doing if not passing this kind of legislation? Before I have to let you go, with regard to legislation, there was a bipartisan group of senators who met today, brought together by Senator Murphy, to try to puzzle something out in terms of what might be passable. There you see Senators Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, who are closer to the political center. Sometimes, you know, Senator Manchin siding with Republicans on some measures against his Democratic colleagues. But the idea is to figure out something that could pass. We're going to put this question to our viewers as well. But, Professor, I wonder what your sense is of what counts as common sense gun legislation today, the, the, the floor, the atomic unit of what we think could become law. Look, there hasn't been meaningful gun safety regulation at the federal level since the 1990s. You'd have to go back almost a quarter century. And so anything that the, the Senate can come up with would be a big deal. Most likely, it wouldn't be as strong as a lot of advocates for gun safety would hope. One of the propositions that's on the table right now, for instance, is uh, federal funding for states to pass laws that set up red flag policies where um, concerned family members and school administrators or law enforcement could call if a person uh, seems to be threatening harm to themselves or to others and law enforcement could remove that person's guns for a, a year is the way that it works in the 19 states that have passed these. And one of the reasons why that legislation might appeal to Republicans is because it's not mandating anything, it's rather just incentivizing it and the states themselves would still have to pass these laws. Some states like Oklahoma have already passed anti-red flag laws. So it would shift the battleground back to the states ultimately. I think that something like that might be possible, but we'll have to wait and see. Eric Rubin, assistant professor at Southern Methodist University's Dedman School of Law. Professor, thanks very much, we appreciate it. Thanks. As we mentioned, a bipartisan group of senators met on Capitol Hill today hoping to come up with new gun safety legislation. That phrase I used, common sense, comes up often at a time like this. But what does that even mean? I kind of think of it like seatbelt regulations, right? Seatbelts will not prevent all crashes, but they absolutely save lives. And refusing to use them is not a good look. So I want your one best idea, just one, on a common sense gun safety law. Feel free to share with us what party you vote with, whether you own a gun or not. We would like to know that we're hearing from a little bit of everybody. You'll find us at NBC Now Tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Email us now tonight at NBCnews.com or leave us a brief but brilliant voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. Remember, one idea only. We will share some of your suggestions soon. We'll get to some of today's other top stories in a moment, including former President Trump being ordered to testify under oath, Kevin Spacey facing possible charges of sexual assault, and the death of a Hollywood legend. Tonight's headlines begin with New York's investigation of Donald Trump, the businessman. Today, a New York appeals court ruled that the former president, Don Jr., and Ivanka must all testify under oath. That testimony could end up in a separate criminal investigation by Manhattan's district attorney. That's a criminal investigation. This civil matter is brought by New York's Attorney General Letitia James. President Trump's lawyers had argued that Ms. James's investigation is politically motivated. A New York state appeals court ruled that is not the case, calling it, quote, lawfully initiated at its outset and well-founded. A statement from Letitia James reads in part, quote, we will continue to follow the facts of this case and ensure that no one can evade the law, unquote. Meanwhile, actor Kevin Spacey is facing new legal troubles. Today, British prosecutors announced that he is facing four counts of sexual assault 
involving three men in the UK. These assaults allegedly happened between 2005 and 2013. One of the charges includes non-consensual sexual activity. Now, to be clear, the UK's Crown Prosecution Service has authorized the charges to take effect upon Mr. Spacey's arrest in England or Wales. He has not been formally charged yet. Kevin Spacey has faced multiple sexual assault allegations over the years. Back in 2017, actor Anthony Rapp accused him of making sexual advances when Rapp was 14. That allegation got Mr. Spacey removed from the Netflix series House of Cards. He has denied all the allegations. Kevin Spacey was also charged with indecent assault in 2018 involving a teenage boy in Massachusetts. He pleaded not guilty and the charges were later dropped. NBC News is awaiting comment from him on the charges in the UK. Hollywood is marking some major passages tonight. First, the death of actor Ray Liotta. The New Jersey native was known for indelible performances in Field of Dreams, the NBC drama Shades of Blue, and my all-time favorite mob movie by Martin Scorsese himself, Goodfellas. I will watch that every time it's on TV. Back in 2005, Mr. Liotta won the Emmy for Outstanding Guest Actor on ER. His publicist says that he died in his sleep. He was in the Dominican Republic shooting a film called Dangerous Waters. One of his co-stars from Goodfellas, Lorraine Bracco, tweeted, I can be anywhere in the world and people will come up and tell me their favorite movie is Goodfellas. Then they always ask, what was the best part of making that movie? My response has always been the same. Ray Liotta, unquote. He lived to be 67. From the death of an icon to the end of an era for one of the happiest shows on television, today was the last episode of The Ellen DeGeneres Show. The series finale included her very first guest, Jennifer Aniston, the pop star Pink, who wrote the show's theme, and singer Billie Eilish. Ellen's calling it quits two years after reports emerged of a toxic workplace environment at the show. The Ellen Show ran for 19 seasons and had more than three thousand episodes and as she likes to point out when it started the openly gay star could not even say the word gay on her own show up next abortion and religion the two often intersect when people talk about their views on this so we'll talk to a panel of faith leaders and share some of your stories when we come back Today, Oklahomans woke up to the strictest abortion law in the country. Last night, Governor Kevin Stitt signed HB 4327 into law. It lets private citizens sue people in civil court for having abortions or for helping someone get abortion services. Oklahoma's law bans nearly all abortions after fertilization, well before many people know they even are pregnant. It does allow abortions when the life of the mother is at risk and in cases of rape or incest, but those have to be reported to the police. The conversation on abortion in America often turns to religious beliefs, what the Bible, the Torah, or the Quran teach, what the interpretations are. Well, what might we learn from what others believe? Let's get into that with our panel. The Reverend Katie Zay is CEO of the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. She's also the author of A Complicated Choice, making space for grief and healing in the pro-choice movement. Also, Rabbi Mara Nathan is senior rabbi at Temple Bethel in San Antonio, Texas. And Dr. Dahlia Fami is an associate professor of political science at Long Island University. She's also a visiting scholar at the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights at Rutgers. Good to have all of you with us. And I wonder if we might start very briefly with just a summation about something regarding your faith and and abortion. Is there something that you wish more people understood from your perspective about what your view of your faith teaches with regard to this issue? Let's just work our way down the line and start with you, Reverend Zay. I would love for people to understand that in the Christian scriptures, Jesus doesn't talk about abortion specifically, but what we see is a model of someone who showed compassion to people at their most vulnerable moments. And so when I think about today, what Jesus would say about where we are right now, he would be someone who's making sure that people get the care that they need. So I would love for folks to know that there's actually a pluralistic view of abortion among Christians. Uh, one particular view is often at the forefront of these conversations, but it doesn't represent most Christians at all. Rabbi Nathan, what about you? 
Um, I think similarly, if we look at the text in the Torah and then also in other commentaries, I think what I want people most to know is that Jewish people are not pro-abortion, but they do recognize um, from the earliest times that there are moments when abortion is a necessary choice and um, that the rights of the woman and her decision and her perspective within the conversation are to be honored and respected. Um, I feel like when we have a religious conversation about abortion, it often puts the woman in a position that she is going to be seen as evil or a criminal for needing to make this choice, but that is definitely not the way that Judaism perceives it. And forgive me, Dr. Fahmy, before you answer, I just want to be clear that the three of you are not here to speak for all Jews, Christians, or Muslims. You are sharing your perspectives on this. So before people start sending me angry tweets, that's between you and <laughs> whatever you pray to or don't. These are just three points of view. Your mileage may vary. Dr. Fahmy, how would you answer that question? Something from the perspective of your religious view of your faith about this issue. And you just hit the nail on the head, Joshua, that there is a variety of schools of thoughts in many different religious communities. And abortion is one of those topics that is, 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 is divisive. But in the faith traditions, all three of them, there is allowance. And when there is allowance, that means there isn't restriction. Now, in the Islamic faith, abortion can happen before 40 days and in some schools of thought before 120 days. Um, and the FIG Council here in North America, they give allowances up until 120 days if the woman's life is at threat or if there's risk to a child. Now, when we think about what this really means, because what we do know about the abortion debate in the United States is that it's really not about religion. The Texas, the Mississippi laws, the Oklahoma laws are motivated by a particular Christian view that forbids all abortion. Now, many religious women, myself included, don't agree with the restrictive Christian view that life begins at conception because it restricts my faith and it restricts how I practice and how I believe. And if you look at the statistics on many faith traditions, um, between 51 and 67 percent of women of faith do not agree that abortion should be outlawed. But what we see highlighted here in the United States is a very minor Christian minority that conception begins at birth and um, uh, uh, life begins at conception and it should be outlawed. And so what we shouldn't allow for is in our democracy, the hijacking of it by a Christian minority. Dr. Fahmy, let me just stick with you very briefly. I wonder what the conversations have been like around you among Muslims with regard to this issue. Muslims in the United States are statistically a very, very small percentage of the U.S. population. The overwhelming majority of Americans describe some kind of belief in, in a personal relationship with God, particularly in a Christian context. So I can only imagine what the conversations have been like with other Muslims that you know about the future of, of Roe v. Wade. But what we do know is that we look at law a little differently, is that there also is law of the state. And that's not based on scriptural interpretation, but rather on the public good. What, we'll, what do we all know is going to happen when abortion is outlawed, is that we are going to have a lot of harm to people. Women will be dying from botched self-abortions. And Muslims do not support this type of harm. So the window through which we view it is what is in the best interest of the public good. And when we know that abortions will continue, but they will increase in harm, well, that's not a part of our faith tradition. Let me get to some of the comments from our viewers, many of which come from a Christian tradition, but not all. Uh, let me get to some comments from Becky and Aaron and Luther and Zephyr, so you can guess what tradition they come from. Becky tweeted, we asked whether or not it conflicts with or agrees with your faith views, and Becky tweeted, conflicts with mine. We believe in equal rights. At the recent pro-choice rally, a bunch of people from my church, including at least one of the pastors, and our recently retired pastor of 19 years, were there. Aaron tweeted, I was raised Methodist. I believe I have no right to tell any other human what they can't do with their bodies. Republicans continue to reduce food stamps, welfare, financial aid to families. It's pretty clear restricting women's health rights is the only thing they care about. And Lutheran Zephyr tweeted, the evangelical Lutheran church in America supports a right to abortion. My faith does not cling to a specific moment at which life begins. My faith recognizes the gut-wrenchingly complicated nature of abortion. My faith leads me to trust women. Thank you all very, very much for sharing your thoughts with us. Rabbi Nathan, I wonder if I could come to you and what the conversations have been like around you, particularly among Jews who may feel that abortion is murder and that if you are against murder as a person of faith, that you must then necessarily be against abortion. 
Well, of course, there's such a wide variety of Jewish beliefs and, and traditions. And so different groups feel differently about this. Um, I think even those who are opposed to abortion in general do recognize that there are moments where it is something that is the right choice to make. So um, I have had that conversation where people will equate abortion with murder, but they're also deciding that the life and the fate of the unborn fetus is more important than the life of the woman who is, whole, you know, is carrying that pregnancy herself. Um, I really do resonate with this idea that if the idea is being pro-life, it means supporting life on all different ways. And our society in general is doing a rather poor job of making sure that there is a sufficient child care, that there's sufficient neonatal care, um, and that we have these women, the majority of whom are either married, um, certainly are poor, who are making choices that are mostly just for the well-being of the children that they already have. Um, the idea of protecting life that is already in the world is of the utmost important. So when I have a conversation with someone who disagrees with me, we're going to, I think, both agree that um, supporting the, li the lives of those who are out in the world, that is certainly from a Jewish perspective, the highest, highest value of all. Reverend Zay, there's been recent polling that shows that support for abortion rights in the U.S. has hit a new high. Uh, the latest polling that we have, the latest NBC News poll shows 37% of people believe that it should be always legal. 23% believe it should be legal most of the time. So the support has kind of grown over the years, and particularly, I think, with the leaking of this draft Supreme Court opinion. How are you dealing with the strong evangelical argument that abortion is murder, since that is very much rooted in evangelical Christianity and you are a Baptist minister? I grew up Baptist as well, so I've heard that argument very a, a whole lot in, in my uh, upbringing. How do you deal with that argument, particularly those Christians who say, I cannot believe that anyone who believes the Ten Commandments that say very simply, thou shalt not kill, could have any support for anything related to abortion? I mean, it's so black and white in the minds of many Christians. How is that debate playing out where you are? Well, as someone who grew up in a conservative evangelical tradition, I am very familiar with the kinds of black and white thinking that doesn't allow for the complexity and the nuances of our lives to really have a place. And what I would say to people who use this kind of inflammatory language is to really think about the people who are impacted by abortion, because abortion is not something that's abstract. It always happens within the context of a person's full life. And when I look at the model of who Jesus was and as Christians, we follow the model of Jesus. He was someone who centered the person who was most impacted. So I would say before making a statement like that, please take the time to listen to people in your community who have had abortions. We know one in three, one in four people who can get pregnant will have an abortion in their lifetime. There are people in your community you love who have had abortions and their stories and their lives matter. So I would ask for them to suspend their judgment and turn to a place of compassion because that's what Jesus did. He stayed with people through their most difficult moments and accompanied them along their journeys. And that's what our call is to do. Our call is not to judge. It is to love and show compassion and seek justice. And that means centering people who are most impacted by these abortion bans. Before I go, Rabbi Nathan, I've got like 20 seconds left. But since you are in San Antonio, I have to ask how your congregation is doing after the shooting in Uvalde. How are folks there doing right now? Very briefly before uh, we go. Yeah, I mean, I really appreciate you asking. We are our we're just heartbroken. Um, it's 90 miles away, but it is so close to our hearts. And um, the city of San Antonio certainly sent out so many resources to Uvalde, but our community is just so devastated to have to be so close to yet another site of a mass shooting. Um, you know, advocating for gun safety is so important and it's a certainly an important part of who we are as a congregation. And um, we want to make sure that people can go to school, that children can go to school and feel safe, and that we can send our children to school and know that they're coming home. So um, just a really one more tragic, tragic moment, certainly in Texas, but in our country as a whole. Yeah, I certainly hope that your community can find some peace and some comfort during this tough time. Rabbi Mara Nathan, Reverend Katie Zay, Dr. Dahlia Fami, we appreciate all three of you making time for us tonight and sharing your perspectives. Thank you all very, very much. 
TikTok is for more than funny dances and silly trends. It's mostly that, but not all. Some Asian American influencers are leaning into their culture online. We'll show you before we go. Any K-pop fans out there? That's Korean pop music, for those who don't know. Even if you're not a fan, you've probably heard of BTS. Next week, the seven-member South Korean boy band is coming to Washington for a meeting with President Biden. They will discuss the rise in anti-Asian hate incidents and celebrate Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month this month. Now, this kind of representation did not exist for generations of Asians growing up here in the U.S. Today, along with BTS, many influencers are using social media to discuss their identities. We spoke with three AAPI influencers about balancing their Asian backgrounds and American identities. I remember thinking, oh, I, I never want to wear these clothes. I never want to be outside, anywhere outside of my home, wearing these Indian clothes because they made me feel ashamed and they made me feel like I wasn't beautiful or I was too different. I immigrated from India, uh, specifically South India, to California when I was 11 years old. And of course, it was very jarring and it was a huge culture shock. And I remember one day I did wear something Indian to school and a lot of kids made fun of me. You know, I stopped wearing what I love to wear and I stopped wearing my bindi. From the day that I was born, I believe my mom put a bindi on my forehead. I didn't realize that it was something that people would mock or make fun of. I felt so embarrassed about wearing it. I took it off halfway through school and I remember never putting it back on. So growing up in Washington as a Chinese um, American, I really wanted to fit in with kind of like the white culture, but also didn't know how to like merge my culture into it. Like bringing dumplings, my mom would make dumplings, I would bring them to school, and I would always get comments like, oh, what are you eating? Like, that is so gross. Or like, oh, what? Lily's bringing seaweed again. So I grew up here in Hawaii it, on Oahu, and I am half white, my dad is from Michigan, and then my mom is Filipino, Japanese, and Korean. And Hawaii is predominantly Asian. It wasn't until I moved to Utah to go to college that I realized like, oh my goodness, like I am not like the rest of this country that I am living in. The first time that I experienced racism, which was when I was like dating this guy. And I've talked about this on TikTok before. I, I brought up being Korean. I was like, da -da -da -da, like I'm Korean. And then he was like, wait, you're Korean? And I was like, yeah. And then he was like, oh, I thought you were full white. And I was like, no, I'm half Asian. And he was like, oh. And then he canceled the jet ski trip. Yeah, because he said that his grandparents got like uncomfortable around people of color. I was like, why can't I just like be like everybody else? Like, why do people have to look at me differently because of the way that I look? Like, that's so absurd to me. Growing up, there was not a whole lot of like Asian American social media influencers or actors, which is why I think I wanted to kind of push away my Asian American heritage because we look at the screen. Those are the role models we see. Like I remember going to a hair salon and like bringing a Hilary Duff photo in. And I told my hairstylist, and I'm like, I want my hair to look like this. I remember someone in school had asked me if people in India take showers. What's portrayed in the media, what we are seen as or what we are viewed as, I think that definitely contributed a lot to feeling ashamed of who I was. I quickly realized that, you know, I can't change who I am. And also I love who I am and I love the culture that I grew up with. All of a sudden you're like, what am I doing? Why am I trying to push away my culture? I want to reclaim my culture. I want to appreciate it. I want to love it. I joined an acapella team in college and we would sing these songs that were mashups of Indian and American music. And that was when it first clicked in my mind that I didn't have to choose just one and completely ignore the other. And in college is when I started posting my Indian clothes online. A lot of South Asian people would respond to those posts saying, wow, this is so great to see someone representing our fashion on social media. I would say 85 to 90% of you know, the things that I've learned and things that I've come to accept in myself, like a lot of that had to do with social media and putting myself really out there and getting that feedback and also being able to help other people. I love Asian food. It's my most favorite food of all the foods. I feel like the TikTok for you page helps you to go to the correct community of people who are either interested in learning about your culture or people who are a part of your culture and 
and just want to feel included within it. Just very endearing to talk about my mom and our upbringing and, and some of our childhood, you know, stories because it's catharsis. It's like a way to connect and relate with people who also shared a similar upbringing. Look, I made more for you. Wow, thanks mom, that's a lot. These ones are very good. Okay, oh, here's another. Another one? And one more. Mom! You'll see a lot of really funny, relatable content about being Asian. And although we come from different parts of Asia, we all have very similar shared experiences. It, this is like the time for us to share our stories our time to like normalize being Asian Americans and sharing our everyday lifestyle. And the more content that you create that has to do with being an API member, that the closer we are to closing that gap between that misunderstanding and acceptance toward our culture. It's almost impossible to box yourself into just one category. I can't only say that I'm Indian or Asian because I live in this beautiful country in America and I have become so American, but I also have that Indian identity. So for me, just bringing in those little moments and little touches and details of my Indian clothes and putting that with my Western clothes was really a way for me to kind of bring in both my identities and showcase that on a daily basis. And I know with my bindi, I had a talk with myself and you know told myself that you shouldn't be ashamed of who you are. And if this is one way that people can identify you as being Indian, then this is going to be the one thing that you're going to wear every day. And so from that day onwards, I have never stopped wearing it. This is something me and my sister talk about all the time, like how happy we are to be Asian and specifically to be creating content. It gives me an opportunity to share who I am and to share my culture and then to bond with other members of my community and to just really feel their love and connection to me. If I were to see that 15 or 16 year old with a Hillary Duff photo, I would tell her, be proud of who you are. Be proud of what you look like. There are so many other wonderful, you know, creators, actors, people out there that share a similar, you know, understanding of where you are right now. I think the beauty in humans is our difference. There's only one you, and that's your superpower. And so you should really embrace yourself. Love it. Absolutely love it. Hey, remember to send us your one best idea for common sense gun laws. We've already got a bunch. Keep them coming. 888-575-2NBC or email nowtonight at NBCnews.com. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thanks for making time for us. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.